just to give you some idea of why Mark and I sort of went our separate ways and perhaps what led up to it. It was, interestingly enough, it was a project we worked together. And I'm not saying that alone was it. It was maybe a catalyst, maybe just a symbol of what was going on. But in the late 1980s, Mark began researching the history of individual freedom for a calendar project, like just a wall calendar that you put up on your wall. And it was intended to highlight bright days and dark days in the history of freedom. Mark himself spent, boy, six months researching, I mean six months solid, eight hours a day, going to libraries, uh, phoning research institutes from around the world to get the history of individual freedom in North America. The calendar was exclusively a Mark Emery project, and the content was largely that chosen by Emery. Each month of the calendar featured a personality that Mark thought was, in some way, associated with individual freedom. Only two philosophers were featured, Ayn Rand and Aristotle, who appeared on the January and February months of the calendar. Others included a range of economists, journalists, and politicians who Emery thought were promoting individual freedom. Peppered amongst the days of the year were events that Emery considered, quote, dark days, unquote, and highlights in the history of individual freedom. Among the dark days were such things as Canada's introduction of socialized medicine in 1946, the adoption of the 16th Amendment in the United States in 1913, which permitted the government to impose an income tax, and interestingly, the execution of Jesus by the government of Pontius Pilate. Among the highlights for the individual freedom calendar were such things as the release of Ayn Rand's novel Atlas Shrugged, the Boston Tea Party, and the very interesting case of Canadian nurse Dorothea Palmer. Palmer was charged but acquitted for distributing information about contraception. Although contraception would not be officially accepted until 30 years after Palmer's acquittal, no Canadian was ever again prosecuted for distributing information about contraception. So as he's doing his research, something very disturbing begins to surface. It seems that almost every time a historic event moved towards freedom, it was never initiated by any democratic process, but rather by somebody breaking the law from slavery, to religious prohibitions, to sexual prohibitions, to laws on abortion, high taxes, restrictions on trade. Someone had to break the law before the law was changed. Everything that was a positive step seemed to be a law-breaking step. And so Mark decided, well, this is the answer. This is the way you change laws. And so he, he started devaluing the democratic process, the whole idea of uh, doing anything politically, because he saw politics moving in total opposite direction and that the only thing moving that he thought was towards freedom was people who were breaking laws, um, theoretically bad laws. One inescapable implication of Emery's theory that freedom could be achieved only by breaking bad laws was that the only thing standing in the way of freedom was government. In 1988, the year in which Emery was jailed, Emery prepared a 1989 calendar that replaced Aristotle and several other individuals from the 1988 calendar with a number of famous anarchists from history, including Henry David Thoreau, Percy Shelley, Hosea Warren, and Murray Rothbard. That same anti-government libertarian sentiment influenced the sorts of things that Emery added to the 1989 calendar's list of highlights and dark days. Among the highlights were such things as the birth of anarchists Lysander Spooner and Herbert Spencer. Among the dark days were such things as the United States having prevented anarchists from entering the country. Indeed, Emery's growing anti-government belief in the need to break oppressive laws colored his characterization of people mentioned in the calendar. The 1988 calendar's entry for Good Friday read, quote, Jesus Christ executed in Jerusalem by Pontius Pilate government, unquote. In Emory's 1989 calendar, that wording was changed to, quote, Jesus of Nazareth executed by Pontius Pilate government for dissent, unorthodox views, and refusal to be loyal to local religious and political doctrines, unquote. Jesus had gone from being an alleged Christ to being something that, for Mark, was much more earthly, familiar, and admirable. Jesus as an outspoken, unorthodox dissenter, critic of religion, and lawbreaker. Emery's 1988 and 1989 calendars were arguably the earliest overt signs that Mark was gradually deciding to stop towing the Freedom Party line with respect to the role of government, and was increasingly fashioning himself as a lawbreaking, lone wolf anarchist. In 1989, the Liberal government of David Peterson passed into law its bill, leaving it up to each municipality to decide whether the retail businesses within its jurisdiction could open on Sundays. The change to the law satisfied nobody. Though he was no longer violating the Sunday shopping law, Emery remained outspoken about the ban on Sunday shopping. 
but his manner and message were somewhat more anti-government. Well, I mean, you I'm need the one, Mr. Nolan, I'm the one that the entire show about you're the man that represents the maverick in society, you're the, you're the man that represents the, the business community. You do not represent them, and you unfortunately do not represent the poor people that have to work out there for minimum they wage. They work for me. And they're the people that are going to suffer across this province. And this is amazing. I'm the person that pays these people. Without me, they don't have a job. With you, they could still be employed. If you disappear tomorrow, no jobs are going to dry up. With me gone, they dry up. Unless I don't have the ability to meet the consumers on my terms, those jobs don't exist. And I resent you saying that somehow you help people. You well, don't. As the Ontario provincial election of 1990 approached, the governing Liberals were rightly portrayed as having been too cowardly to take on a province-wide stand on the Sunday shopping issue. Though, in reality, the progressive Conservatives similarly tried to straddle the line. Both parties saw that public opinion was shifting in favour of the wide-open Sunday shopping that Emory and Freedom Party had long been advocating. In contrast, the New Democratic Party, which Emory had supported a decade earlier, campaigned vociferously in favor of imposing a strict province-wide ban on Sunday shopping. It was a perfect opportunity for Emory to capitalize upon his having gone to jail over the Sunday shopping issue. However, by September of 1990, Mark had run for federal office as a libertarian, had run for city council twice, and had run as a Freedom Party candidate in Ontario once. Although he had come close to winning on his second attempt at city council, his strenuous efforts had borne no electoral fruit. Emery decided against running for office in the 1990 provincial election, but Metz and others nonetheless used the opportunity to campaign for individual rights and to keep up the pressure against the ban on Sunday retailing. Fundamentally, we believe that the purpose of a government in a free society is to protect the individual's freedom of choice and not to restrict it. Yes, we fundamentally support freedom of choice in Sunday shopping, and, uh, you know, if you have Sunday shopping laws, you're violating fundamental rights. I think that a vote for a Freedom Party is a vote for a change, it's a vote for a principle, and it's a vote for individual freedom of choice. More important than your vote is your ongoing support, because building an organization that's electable in the future requires a lot of groundwork and a lot of grassroots activity. While Metz spoke of long-term support and the long-term goal of winning an election, Emery was turning his attentions to the immediate term and to activism on an issue that he and Metz had taken on before, censorship. Actively opposing censorship was nothing new to Mark. In 1984, Metz and Emery testified before the Fraser Committee on Prostitution and Pornography. Local feminists and religious groups, attempting to have erotic magazines banned from variety stores, trumped up false allegations that child pornography was being sold in such stores. With one simple economic incentive, Mark proved them to be lying. A London businessman offered $500 to anyone who could show him a store selling child porn. Nobody claimed the $500. Feminists and Christian people who are using this pornography hysteria are using this child porn scare to cover the fact they are trying to ban, censor, and prohibit materials that basically they're just personally and politically opposed to. And what does it boil down to? They're indeed against sex and the enjoyment of representations of sex. In 1989, Mark discovered that Canada had banned the importation and sale of a popular American album, Nasty As They Wanna Be, by the rap group The Two Live Crew. The album featured explicit, taboo sexual references, and largely for that reason, was increasingly popular among some youth. Any record store that was previously handling this tape, and there were four or five, um, have had visits by the police, and they've been told, in no uncertain words, that they will be charged if they uh, continue to handle it. So consequently, all four record stores that did handle it withdrew it from sale, and I find that's police intimidation, and that's unacceptable in a free society. Acting independently of Freedom Party, Mark obtained copies of the album and began selling them quite openly in his bookstore. On October 22, 1990, Emery was charged under Canada's obscenity laws for selling the Two Live Crew album. Having come to the opinion that freedom had only ever been achieved not through elections, but through lawbreaking, and seeing no short-term electoral success, Emery was losing patience. And at a Freedom Party dinner held three weeks after being charged for selling the Two Live Crew album, Emery followed up the guest speaker's speech with an abrupt, unscheduled, impromptu speech of his own. Um, I listened to speeches by Bob and, and Bill Peterson, and uh, they may have described <coughs> part of the problem we're in, but they really didn't describe it as a solution. I think that's more, more important. I think most of us here, especially, are educated enough to know what the problem is. The thing is, so what the hell do we do about it? Really, that's the bottom line. I mean, we all know democracy's a piece of shit, in my opinion. I won't, I won't lie to you. 
Yeah, it's just, it's garbage, right? I mean, the whole democratic process is garbage. I mean, we run elections every year, and we appeal only to the disaffected because the mass majority of people don't give a darn. They are too confused to know what the hell they want. And when they're given the power to rule someone else's lives, they'll seize that like they do in any kind of panic situation. They grasp at straws. To me, there's only one way to get social change, and historically, this is the only way I've ever noticed, and uh, and it certainly worked for me, and it's worked historically. The only reason we got rid of slavery in the United States is because people went and broke the law and helped slaves for get free. They just took them. They just disobeyed the law, the Fugitive Slave Act, and they brought them over, and they said, to hell with you, put me in jail, or we'll have a civil war. You know, the reason the abortion laws were changed is because doctors performed abortions anyway, even if it was against the law, and they said, I don't care, charge me. Eventually, it's going to come down. And uh, you look at every kind of law, from prohibition. People drank anyway. The law was just, they just said, fine, go ahead, charge us. You know, and, uh, you know, do what you can. But eventually the law was changed because people broke it, disobeyed it. Historically, every good thing that has happened in our society in social change is because people simply disobeyed the bad law and went ahead and did what they wanted to anyway. And they made their point to the public by saying, I don't care about the consequences. This is too important to me to worry about some petty jail term or some fine or some embarrassment of the court. It doesn't concern me. I don't care. I'm going to go and do what I want anyway. And that, when you think about it, folks, is the only way we got anything good in this whole society. Because nothing good has come from democracy. No great change ever occurred because some politician wanted it to. This is absolutely true. In fact, that's why Freedom Party is so unique. We think it can be won through the democratic process. What Mark fails to understand, from my point of view, is that there has never been a party like this before. So obviously, it can never have been won through a democratic process. That choice never existed democratically. Yes, but how can you expect to reverse this trend when, as we've said, the country is run by majority rule through ballot, and that majority seems to prefer to vote for this modified welfare state? Oh, I don't believe that. You know as well as I do that the majority today has no choice. What do you mean? The majority has never been offered a choice between controls and freedom. The majority of the people has never been given a choice. You know that both parties today are for socialism, in effect, for controls, and there is no party. There are no voices to uh, offer an actual pro-capitalist, let's say fair, economic freedom and individualism. That is what this country needs today. You always had someone of the left to right wing spectrum. Either, you know, you've got various choices of which government prohibitions you want. You never had a complete package based on, a, on one consistent principle. Mark was calling not only for the abandonment of elections, but also for an abandonment of the effort to change people's minds. An abandonment of philosophical advocacy. So the bottom line is you want social change, forget about elections, forget about convincing your neighbor he's too busy doing other things to worry about some intellectual argument about why we need a dramatic revolutionary change of the intellect. It's just not going to happen. You want to use your time effectively, you do what I do. You just say, fuck you, I'm going to break the law, and uh, give me 10 days of court time, give me three weeks of non-stop publicity, I want to talk to everybody I can get to about why this is a bad law, why this law cannot coexist in a free society, why I refuse to obey it, and why I'm encouraging everybody else to disobey it, and if you let people like me go on forever, you're going to have a revolution on your hands. So my advice to you is stop fucking around with me and get rid of this bad law. <laughs> okay. That, now you're going to get significant social change. I'll tell you one thing, it worked with Sunday shopping. I broke that law every way. One day, I gave books away free before Christmas. That was so absurd. People that immediately got people sympathy. 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 And by going to court on Sunday shopping, people were able to galvanize and say, here's a lone man doing something moral and proper. He believes in it. He's willing to go to jail. And it's hard to dislike someone who does that. It's hard to hate someone who does that. It's easy to admire someone who does that, and that's what you've got to do. And the worst that can happen is you finally have your big day, Howard Rourke in court, Howard Rourke in court, Howard Rourke in court. You can say, finally, I did one thing that can last for posterity, for eternity. It's on the books, it's in the papers, I can show my kids. You can actually say you did something. You didn't just talk about it, you didn't give money to someone else so they could do it. You actually did something. You actually have a living legacy to show children in the future when they say, what the fuck did you do to stop the tyranny that we have today? You can say, I did this. Fuck this democracy. Get out, break those goddamn laws. Get out and say it in public, say it in advance, say it proudly, say it strongly. Get people to get in on it with you and help out. And believe me, any law that bugs you won't be there in 10 years because there'll be other people that'll see your example, see your example, see your example, and they'll say, darn right, I can do that. So enough of this conversation about what the problems are. The problems are so immense. Just pick one. Just pick one. Just pick one. And go ahead and disobey it. 
and so I guess he figured that was the way to go, that was the quickest way to go. And uh, it, it would be if that's your only objective, is to fight a single law, or to fight a single oppression, you get one monkey off your back, but don't worry about the rest of them. However, my agenda was something very different. My agenda was not just one monkey or two. I wanted to get that whole, didn't want to have any monkeys on our back. Let's, 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 uh, let's move government in a positive direction, in a free direction. And uh, Mark just saw that as too long-term goal. And I saw it as a long-term goal too, but there was no other metaphysical reality about it. There's, you not, can't shorten it up. You know, it's like time travel. You can wish about it, but it ain't gonna happen. Just days after giving his speech at the Freedom Party dinner, Emery resigned from the executive of the Freedom Party. He later told the press that he did not believe in the democratic process anymore, and that Canada would be better off without a government. He said he had no problems with Freedom Party itself, but that his beliefs had evolved to a point where his principles would no longer allow him to be a member of any political party. When he was with the Freedom Party, he always had to be very careful not to say this or, you know, present such an image. We believe that the purpose of government should be to protect your freedom of choice and not to restrict it. And I think it must have been a relief to him just to get rid of all that and just do things the way he wanted to do them. Exiting Freedom Party, Mark made official his break with efforts to change people's minds, to strengthen people's recognition of individual rights and principles, and to replace bad government with good government. Instead, Mark would embrace the pursuit of people's hearts, seeking their love, their sympathy, and their anger with government's punishment of an honest, admirable breaker of bad laws. People will even grudgingly respect you, even when they disagree with you, and the people that do agree with you will tell you outright, I wish I had your courage. And eventually, if enough people do it, they will have your courage. So that's what I'm saying. Get the fuck out there and break those laws. <laughs> While on public display, he would take his lumps courageously and hope that his example would be followed by others would break other bad laws and increase people's rejection of government altogether.